Well, thank you so much for the organizers to invite me to present. Ah, uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, thank you, everyone. Sorry, silly joke. Uh, so, guys, I would like to present today um, a work and a paper that I have been working for the last year and a half when I started working in this project, basically. I, I start working in this paper because we involved with this project with Connor. And so it's a work in progress, basically. And I really appreciate any kind of comments that you can give me for this kind of exploration about a relatively recent phenomenon in Colombia called kidnapping. I don't know if you know that this is really recent. So I'm going to split my presentation in two moments. The first part is a characterization of kidnapping that I have been doing in Colombia to try to understand the dynamics of kidnapping for a quantitative point of view. So I'm going to show some statistics that I have been working on the last couple of months. And in the second part, I'm going just to try to, to give you a, a try and understanding of how civil society in Colombia had been responding to the threat of kidnapping and how you can maybe understand all like the social movements in Colombia for that kind of perspective. What kind of uh, projects, uh, actions, political uh, motivations they have been developing just to, to address kidnapping in Colombia. So this is more for like sociology of rights perspective, so it's more like for a sociological point of view. So the first part is, so I have been working with some official and unofficial databases to just to track from the 70s, the the problem of kidnapping in Colombia. So I have been working with official uh, data from the police, from the military forces, for the attorney general, uh, for the Colombian National Center of Historical Memory that I know that Maurice is going to explain more about what is the, the mean of this institution in his presentation, and from NGOs such as CINEP, when I used to work there, and another NGO that is called Pais Libre that I'm going to explain what is this about. So after working with those, these databases, I, I think I characterized like a six moments to understand kidnapping in Colombia, like a six phases. So the first one is from the 70s to, oh, sorry, the 70s to almost the 90s. That is the development of kidnapping in Colombia. The second phase is the increase and expansion of that problem in Colombia for especially five years, from 1995. And of course, you are going to see a correlation between the Colombian armed conflict and of course, the expansion of kidnapping. The escalation, that is just uh, from 1996 to 2000, that was with the peak of the kidnapping problem in Colombia, and in phase four, the crisis and contention of the problem, the de-escalation, and post-crisis and transformation. So I, with the data that I have been working, I, I did these, these phases, and you can see like, oh, like the, the waves of how kidnapping cases in Colombia have been developed. So if almost had been a, 14,000 cases, almost in the last uh, 70, how much years? 45 years, 40, 72, 80, 18, 90, yeah, 48 years. So, and you can see in these two phases that escalation and, and crisis. In terms of who have been the perpetrators of the problem, you can see like a four main groups, guerrillas, such as M19, FARC, and the LNN with all these and of course, in the most difficult moments of the confrontation in Colombia, you can see like the peaks of kidnappings by an actor from paramilitary groups and for organized crime. So you, you can, of course, see how this escalation kind of have a correlation with the Colombian armed conflict. And in the last seven years, a really interesting like change because the peace process that we're having, like for the organized crime taking the place of guerrillas. So basically this data is showing us two things. First, how definitely it's a correlation with the Colombian armed conflict. So kidnapping just was more high because the dynamics of the conflict. And secondly, how in the last couple of years, the organized crime are just taking the places of the guerrilla groups in the kidnapping, as a kidnapping perpetrators. So of course I can share all this data with you and, and try to, of course, explore more what these kind of, of numbers can, well, are, are telling us. So just basically a characterization of kidnapping in Colombia, uh, types of kidnapping, economic kidnapping or kidnapping for ransom is the 84%, 
Political kidnapping is the 12%, and it's going to be a characteristic, like in a global trends, how political kidnapping is characteristic in Colombia, and other kinds of, of kidnappings in the 4%. By age is, well, the 17 of, as you can imagine, just between 18 and 60 years old, so basically like people in, in this range is, has been more likely to be kidnapped. The duration of kidnapping, and this is something that is characteristic in Colombia, and it's more than a year, it's 9%. We are going to see well, later cases of people being kidnapped for 12, 15 years because of the dynamics of the conflict, but it's between one and a month in the 60% of the cases. The resolution of the kidnapping is, uh, sorry, basically is by released by payment, so it's just like a showing the correlation with the normal cases of, of how kidnapping uh, happened, like by, by payment, and it's 80% uh, of, of males kidnapped by gender, and this is for me the most interesting thing, and it's like basically Colombians have been kidnapped in, in, in the last 45 years, right? But it's like a public perception that more foreigners can be kidnapped in Colombia. So basically for me, just, just they, this data is showing me how this media narrative about Colombia being a hotspot for kidnapping for foreigners, well, has not been true actually. It's more like, kin yeah, by, by Colombians. So with these considerations, I'm just going to, to be more, what kind of, yeah, like civil society responses to this kidnapping, and, and I'm feeling more comfortable talking about this. So the first one is how drug traffickers respond. And it's between the 70s and, and 90s, kidnapping was used for drug cartels to just to send messages, like a, a, a kind of to weaponize uh, the other groups, or like a try just to, of course, send some message. So the first like a civil society response to kidnapping in Colombia were the creation of paramilitary groups and death squads to fight against. And it's a really famous uh, group called Death to Kidnappers Group, the MAS, that was actually the first paramilitary group in Colombia. I know if Gustavo maybe can correct me. It was the first paramilitary uh, group, right? Not, I not really the first, but the first published by drug traffic. Exactly. And this is a really famous case that this was the, the Ochoa brothers, one of the drug uh, uh, cartels, uh, just uh, try to well, create this group in order to revenge the kidnapping of one of the relatives that was uh, Ochoa, I don't remember the name, like uh, the Marta Nieves, Marta Nieves exactly. But, but, um, I, I'm going it's to good to because he's an expert in this, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to steal you one minute, and, and I, I promise that I discount for the time. Um, but this group was dismantled immediately, she was related. So there was no mass, and 10 other groups used the name of mass. In fact, there was another kidnapping of uh, the children of a drug trafficker in Bogota. And they, of course, they used paramilitaries with the uh, support of the of a police official. And Pablo Escobar himself uh, sent a plane, um, dropped the leaf, saying that the mass is over and they don't have anything to do with that new group, that there was no mass. Yeah. So, so it's interesting start to just try to understand the Colombian armored conflict just for that perspective, like uh, how all these paramilitary groups and the squads and of course the relationship. But So the second response was in the 90s and it's like a, the traditional ways like how civil society start to organize to uh, deal with the problem. So the first one was the creation of NGOs and this is like maybe the most famous NGO in Colombia who work to support victims and to try to deal with, with the kidnapping. And it's called País Libre. The, that free country. And this NGO was, was very really interesting because they was creating some public awareness about kidnapping in Colombia and just become a, a politic uh, active NGO. The second, oh, sorry, the second response was uh, different ways to support victims. And in 1984, it started the first edition of a radio show, radio program called Voices of Kidnapping. That was the use of radio to send message to the people that were in captivity in Colombia, especially the uh, Colombian Armed Forces for people that were kidnapped in the jungle and other stuff, and Mauricio is going to, to tell us more later. This, the third uh, response was the, the creation of the anti-kidnapping bill in 1983, and this was a political, act, active, uh, a political action ba basically made by, by País Libre, but was the first anti-kidnapping law of the country in the 1983. And of course, you can see a correlation with the escalation of the, of the conflict. So in the moment that was more high, the problem, the, of course, the Colombian way was what? to create a bill, to create a legal <laughs> a bill just to deal with the problem. So that was interesting, but it was the first political uh, uh, attainment. 
and the other was the, uh, yeah, the, the voice of kidnapping. Other response was, especially in 1986 to, to 2000, I was the public demonstrations against kidnapping. I was the creation of a group called the No More Movement, the No Mass, and was basically the catalyst of different demonstrations across the country to say Colombian society is absolutely just like, we don't want more kidnappings. We are absolutely just, how, and it can be like ex, how can I say this in English? Like absolutely yeah. exhausted about that. So, so we need to definitely create some public awareness. <laughs> and you're helping me, thank you. I will help you with your presentation <laughs> later. But it was so interesting because they created a public awareness about the thing. And that for me is still in like in the Colombian conscious, like how these demonstrations create so like a public awareness about kidnapping. And they create a, a citizen's mandate for peace, life and freedom. And it basically was like a political response from the civil society to say, politicians please do something against this. If the army do something because we are absolutely uh, devastated about the, the problem. Well, another uh, moment was the creation of this group called Asfami Pass, that is a really interesting NGO that basically is the Colombian associations of relatives of members of the public force retains and released by guerrilla groups. This NGO is really interesting because they create public awareness about the soldiers, because in, in that time you have like a different types of classes of people kidnapped, like politicians and soldiers. Politicians get a lot of public attention, right? Like Ingrid Betancourt, for example, like a really famous, this is like a high class uh, uh, kidnap person and uh, all the spots are there. But people like police forces in a remote towns of Colombia that nobody cares, so this and you try to create awareness of that. Like, a police, it's not just the politicians, it's not just the wealthy. You, we need to do something about our police forces and our militaries that are just uh, dying in the jungle. So it's, it, that was a, a really interesting uh, NGO. And of course, they start to do something called activism. It's like a create different expressions of collective action using art. And this is called the memory bricks. So in order to create this awareness um, and try to create some personal connection with the people that work in MAP, uh, they create like the names and these bricks that was public installations just going across the country to create this kind of, I don't know, a personal uh, emotion with the, with the person that was kidnapped. And of course, uh, more, more radio shows. Uh, from 2001 to 2005 was another kind of, of activism and was uh, catalyzed by the humanitarian exchange campaign. It uh, was a political moment to say, like, okay, we can just exchange some uh, people from the guerrillas for people that are kidnapped, and start like a huge debate in Colombia to how to deal with that, and start some public uh, actions in the, in the public squares, like saying people that had been in, like, in cage and all the stuff, and another installation called the Walls of Memory, so different pictures of people that are, are kidnapped, just again going around the country, and the creation of the Center for Attention to Kidnapping and Extortion for Business and Companies. This was uh, for the private sector. And in to, from 2006 to 2010 was the No More Kidnappings demonstrations that were just actually huge, like almost like according to different records, like uh, maybe 20 million of people in Colombia just go to the streets to demonstrate and get kidnapping, particularly against the kidnappings perpetrated by FARC. And some police members that were released by the guerrillas start to do, again, some public demonstrations, just uh, marching across the country. And some uh, universities start to create another public awareness, and this was a strategy called Adopt a Kidnap Person Project. So basically, you just adopt a person who was kidnapped and start to create some public campaigns, a public awareness to don't forget the people that are still in, in captivity. And of course, just to take the, the position of the kidnap, the kidnap person to, or the missing just to, to do something about it. And in 2008, the Victims Reparation Bill, that was the first bill to start thinking how we're going to create some legal reparations of people that had been kidnapped. Uh, and just in recent years, the, the Colombian Peace Agreement and Victims Law are, I think, one of the two most important um, moments in Colombia to just to address politically the issue of kidnapping. Uh, the end of the NGO Free Country, Pais Libre just finished his, his, his work in 2017. And these two, two moments that are, I think are developing at the moment, and is the establishment of the Colombian National Center for Historical Memory. Oh, Maurice is going to show us one of his projects about kidnapping in the afternoon. And finally, the creation of something that I call the memory communities. So having all, uh, of course, another really interesting response was the explosion in Colombia about kidnapping diaries. 
So all the people that came for a kidnap experience start to, to, to do some narratives about their experience from, I don't know, from politicians like Clara Rojas or Ingrid Betancourt, Ingrid Betancourt, for people from the police, politicians, uh, people like, like this uh, really controversial one that this was just uh, a person who was kidnapped by ELNN. And, but it was like a, a huge narrative to try to create a, a memories about that experience. But it's, I think for me, yeah, something that's too interesting to explore as a way of political action and create some narratives of memory. So saying all of this, just like I want to share some, some ideas that I, that I have been developing. The first one is like, I think Colombia is, 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 is in transit from a resilient and resisting groups. So just like, in, we are not just resisting about kidnapping, just try to create memories communities about that. So we're not trying to create some, some narratives of collective memory or political memory of what happened with kidnapping in order to, to, to create like a public memory and public awareness about that. Second thing is like activism as a tool to claim human rights in the public sphere how the creation of the walls of memory, the public demonstrations with memory bricks, and all this kind of like emotional and more aesthetic expression of, of, of art to just to claim kidnapping is a really interesting thing to, to explore. The construction of non-official narratives about kidnapping in Colombia from a victim's perspective, it's like a how we can go into deal with the memory and how victims are going to contribute to creating this non-official and not just the official narrative about what happened in kidnapping. Because if I can ask you, of, Everybody said like a Colombia is a successful case of how to deal with the kidnapping epidemic and in Mexico it's like a, yes, we cannot just go on Colombia to see how they deal. But I think it's not, not the case. We're still having a lot of, of problems with, with kidnapping at the moment. But it's how we're going to construct the non-official narratives. And finally, some construction of the social frameworks and narratives of resistance against the practice to build the shared past and help transitional justice process. So for me, it's another key issue to, to see how all these reflections and thinking about kidnapping in Colombia can help the process of transitional justice and how we're going to deliver the truth about what happened to the victims and how we're going to create like a momentum to just deal really with this problem and not just like in another way. The development of multiple, multiple frameworks of collective action. I, for me, as, as a sociology of rights, I really want to know more and deep all these kind of collective actions and, and trying to understand how they restore the sense of citizenship because yeah, they're not going to be victims. How are we going to be this pass from victims to citizens, especially for kidnapping victims groups? And finally, something that I will just talk with, with Conor yesterday in the presentation, all this relationship with the intimacy and kidnapping in Colombia. That was something that I, I didn't expect, but with working with Connor, it's like, okay, how are we going to deal with all this thing about emotional relationships during captivity in Colombia, social dynamics of context of kidnapping, the connections and, and all the stuff. So thank you for listening. Thank you.